Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Juan Gray from Deadly Class, and I'm chilling with your boy Galaxy from Comic Con Radio. Vamos. This school trains killers to master the deadly arts. It's dedicated to the self-liberation of oppressed people. People like you. You're at King's Dominion. You survive your way, and I'll survive mine. The rules are simple. No disobedience. No drugs. And no sex. That's all you savages think about. You've got dicks on the brain. <laughs> Hating what's wrong is easy. I'm gonna do something about it. Well, let's see what you've got. We're gonna party forever and rule the world. Have a good weekend, future disruptors of America. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Galaxy signing in for Comic-Con Radio. Coverage of pop culture events from around the globe. Amazing interviews with celebrities. Daily recaps and reviews of popular television. The Walking Dead. Z Nation. Van Helsing. DC Titans. Flash. The Legends of Tomorrow. Black Lightning. American Horror Story. The Green Arrow. Movie reviews. Everything Comic-Con and fandom from around the globe. Comic-Con Radio. Get ready to enter our universe. Let's go. Go, go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is your boy Galaxy on another amazing episode of Comic-Con Radio. All the episodes are amazing because our guests are amazing. Today we have a cool young dude. He's on an amazing new hit TV show that's hitting the waves by storm. This guy writes, he directs, he acts, he does all sorts of things. We have Juan, which is Juan on Deadly Class 2. We have Juan Gray. What's up, Juan? What's up, buddy? How you doing today? Hey, what's going on, Galaxy? Hey, thanks for having me, man. Uh, Thank you, bro, for coming out. We appreciate it. You uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to come on our show and uh, chit-chat with us today. We're happy to be here, bro. I heard you're in Los Angeles. Uh, are you bummed with the weather? So my thing got delayed a little bit, so I'm actually going to L.A. Uh, in the morning. I'm going to arrive over there, so I haven't seen the weather yet, man. That's crazy, though. Yeah, thank God you're not here, man. It's storming like there's no tomorrow, and I know people are probably bummed out about it. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I was really down for, for the nice sun and everything, but uh, do you think it could change? No, nah, man, it's not going to change in the next few days. I think it's going to be bad weather for the next few days, but uh, how long are you going to be here for? Uh, right now, I'm going to be there for a week before I have to head back for, for a project, but um, yeah, I'll be there for, for a week right now. So. That's cool, though. You know what's up. You know how it is, So, but uh, it's all good. It might change. Let's, let's uh, pray to the uh, universe, but uh, for now, it's raining pretty bad, but it's all good man if you come to LA a lot that's cool and you must come to LA because you're you do movies and you do commercials and you produce you didn't grow up in LA did you where did you grow up no so I'm originally from from Mexico um, but uh, my my parents are are Mexican but we actually grew up in Montreal so I I grew up in Montreal and Canada I traveled a little bit for soccer my whole world growing up it was my passion and what I did uh, pretty much every day and that actually allowed me because I was playing at a pretty high competitive uh, level. I represent Canada at some point, so I played in the Europe and South America, and I got to know more of the world through soccer at first. But um, most of my life, I I was in Montreal. That was where I, I was born and raised. That's pretty cool, dude. You know, Canada is an amazing place right now for up-and-coming actors or even current actors to play in many cool shows because everything in our universe is filmed there. I think it's a cool spot to be at. Yeah, definitely. And Deadly Class is filmed there, correct? Yeah, we filmed Deadly Class in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. That's pretty cool, man. You know, I've had Siobhan on, I've had Luke on, I have you on now, and Canada's the place to be. I thought you had Jack as well. Right? Yeah, we had Jack as well. He's a really cool dude, and uh, we're going to just keep getting the Deadly Class cast members. One by one, we're going to bring them to Comic-Con Radio. <laughs> no. 
But thank you for coming, man. It, it, we appreciate it highly because I know right now, this last summer, I saw Deadly Class everywhere, dude. Like the whole thing was taken over by Deadly Class. And it must have felt good that you're part of that show, right? Yeah, it's super cool because friends of mine and people who know that, that I'm involved with it, they started getting new pictures pretty much a little bit around the world. Even in Mexico, you see they have some stuff on the buses and it's going everywhere, which is really cool. And especially the commercials. One of my cousins was in Mexico just like making a quesadilla in, in the kitchen and just a Deadly Class commercial, you know, is popping up. He filmed it. He's like, look, I see you on screen. You know, so it's cool working on a project that is uh, universal. It's so cool because your name is Juan and the character's name is Juan. So I don't think you'll ever mess up or misplace your call when you're in action. Exactly. That's the pro. That's the good side of it. <laughs> Sometimes, if you, you know, I was talking about that with uh, Maria, like early on on set, because she also has the same name, right? So Maria Gabriela de Faria is playing Maria as well. So we were talking about, you know, we're the two people that have the same exact name in real life and in the show. But it's cool, man. It's cool. It doesn't happen often. So, yeah, man, it's pretty cool. You think when Rick was casting you guys, he wanted that to happen? He's like, oh, Juan, you fit the bill. You look like this guy. Because I know you have a full head of hair. I've seen you in your other projects. And did you shave yeah, yeah. your head for this project? Well, I shaved it twice beforehand. I had some headshot done with the look. And my agent said, you know, it's a good look for, you know, a couple of different stuff. Like that cut made me look maybe a little more more aggressive maybe a bit older it gives a different look completely right i look very very different so i did, had some professional headshots took in like my agent told me and basically when this when this role came up and the casting came um, my agent sent i think a normal headshot and then and then that headshot where my head was shaven and they i think they liked that look so that then they're like okay we want to see him for an audition did a self tape and then it just you know the whole casting process started from there and your name is Juan so it's probably cool so it kind of like fit in because sometimes the casting directors and the people that get all the wheels running it's all about feeling dude I'm telling you you play that role perfect out of a lot of people everybody is cast perfect but you're one of those guys that fit that role really well you look <laughs> like the gangster <laughs> I appreciate that man I appreciate that. Yeah, but we all know you're not like that in real life. You're a good guy. You're a writer. You're you're from Canada, man. You're a good person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, and no, I would try, try to always be a uh, you know good person, positive individual who is spreading spreading light out there, man. But uh, and and it's it's cool that Deadly Class gives us also a platform to to keep talking to people and and sharing good energy out there. Because I think it's a very positive show that, you know, it's, it's a really badass show, but it's something that when people like the cast and every, the class is so, so lovely and everyone on it, such good individuals from talk to young generation and demographic about what we really believe in, you know, outside of the show. Of course, man. Hey, you're working with the Russo brothers or Rick Remender. You're working with Sci-Fi. You're with Benedict Wong. This is amazing. Plus your yeah. castmates. They're cool too, man. This is a lucky situation. Absolutely. No, I'm super grateful working with a project with the Russo brothers. Rick is a super cool person. Sometimes I have a question about something. I, I text him. He gets back to me right away. And he's just a really down-to-earth person. Benny as well. I have some couple funny stories with Benedict Wong as well. And um, yeah, the whole cast is really great people, to be honest. I think I got really, really lucky. Worked very, very hard for it. But at the end of the day, I believe that you create your own luck the harder you work and the more hours that you put into something and you truly believe in it it happens but i'm super super grateful to be a part of this project there's guys like robert downey jr and you go to their social media page and they only follow like 30 people and one of those 30 people actually two of them are the russo brothers and the other one is benedict wong so that means you're part of something really elite when somebody has 40 million followers and they're only following 30 and two of them are these guys <laughs> you're in a good situation yeah. my man yeah man plus totally. you play that role well i have to keep saying that because when i saw you on the show you know I kind of get to see some of the episodes in advance. I got some pull here and there. I don't know why I do, but I do. And I got to see you in episode one and two and three ahead of time. And I saw you. I was like, this dude right here, he fits that role so good. You look like I want to kick your ass, but... That's what you're supposed to be doing, man. You fit that gangster role. You play it so well, man. I got to give you an award for that. <laughs> give me an award for that. That's really nice of you, man. I really appreciate that. It's, that's, that's nice. And it's cool because sometimes I feel like having, you know, especially in the, in the first episode, it, what's cool is it's a growing character. 
but especially in the beginning, it's very little scenes. And, and so every moment really counts. And at the same time, you have to recognize, I think, as an actor, when the scene is about you and when it's not in the beginning, it's really not. So you're just there to help the story. And I think sometimes that's very difficult to do, in my opinion, compared to other projects that I've done where you're either a lead of a, of a project or you have a whole story arc. Now you just kind of have to fill and make sure that whatever you do, you help the other characters look their best, do their best and make the story move forward. So that it's been a great experience for me just doing that. And sometimes you just jump in a scene and you don't really know. I mean, you of course, you read the script and everything, but you don't really know what happened very in detail before and after. So you just kind of trust your instincts and, and do the best you can. So I really appreciate that. Uh, those comments, man, it means a lot. Yo, yeah, big time, man. I totally understand. In the beginning, you're trying to set up the character. It's all about everybody else. I get it. I've seen some episodes to come, and you have some bigger roles coming up. But the last episode was really cool when Michael Duvall, he shoots the guy, and he tells you, hey, tell my dad the job's done, and you turn around. That's a very gangster moment right there. That like is the epitome of what you guys are there for, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. You're going to build huge fans, man. And I know this summer when you guys go to Comic-Con, whether it's San Diego, New York, or wherever, there's a billion of them now. And I know it's going to be a frenzy, man. Hey, no, I'm excited for that, man. And I'm a big fan of Comic-Con, bro, so I'm super excited to experience that. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, Comic-Con has been around for such a long time. It started off with New York back in the 60s, and then San Diego made it huge, and then New York is humongous now, and it's just amazing. And I know, man, you're going to be everywhere. And you're going to get Comic-Cons like in Texas or like in Pennsylvania or like Timbuktu, but hey, just go to all of them. Yeah. Enjoy it because the fans are everywhere. And remember one thing, bro, and I know you know this already, it's all about the fans. It They control... <laughs> this entire universe we don't we're just going along with the ride they control who they love who they like and you're on a good path man yeah man what has been your favorite moment so far on the show you know to be honest with you my favorite moments is everything because this was something we actually followed like walking dead comics like this there's a few that we followed and we read because it's fun and we knew something was coming out we found out about this a little over a year ago and i know you guys filmed like almost a year ago it took a while for it to get released and we were kind of itching for this to come out but so far everything is great man but i like the gangster moments in the episodes i like the scenes where you guys are like murdering people no nah, you know what i think that my favorite episodes are the ones that haven't even been released yet just because right? <laughs> i mean I've, I've read the whole thing yeah honestly i, I believe it, it only gets better with time which is really good like if we're talking about me because there's so many scenes that i love with ben with honestly every actor i can start mentioning scenes that i love with each one so it'll take me forever but the last scene in the car i really enjoyed shooting that scene you know that scene that you're talking about where Michel Duval, who is a great guy, a really good friend of mine as well. Other guys also call Michel, um, Michel Isarubio, who was a great friend of mine while I was shooting in Vancouver and who showed me a lot because I'm from Montreal, right? So I had to travel to, Van to Vancouver. I was staying there, living there a few months. Both Michels, like, we connected very, very well and we actually worked on a couple projects together, all three of us that uh, we'll be releasing in the in the near future. Can't talk too much about it right now. And that scene was a really cool one to shoot outside with Maria and the lighting and everything. It was that was that I think that, that that's one of my, my favorite scenes and Mitchell did such a great job and Maria as well on that scene, you know? He plays his role really well. Like, if you want to hate somebody, that's a character. And he has that look, hate. you know? He has that, like, menacing look that is just, like, intensity, man. You know, he played a mafia member's son, you know, the head of the cartel, and then now he's a cartel's mm -hmm. son here. It's cool. It's cool, man. Absolutely. I just think the shaved heads really make it more menacing and more gangster and the tats on the hands and the like the just the bad attitude and like treating his girlfriend bad and just like you know it's just you guys play it well man it's really cool i can't wait for everyone to see i don't want to talk anymore either because i might spill some beans i don't want to <laughs> but um there's some cool stuff and we're going to follow this series we followed a lot of series to the end but i think this is going to go on for a long time man i have a good gut feeling about it 
I do too. And I have a very, very strong feeling as well. And I hope that I get to be a part of it more because it's, it's just such a cool show to be a part of, you know, and I see a lot of success in it. And I think fans are really going to like what's coming. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can basically vouch for that. So, you know, aside from acting, I know you're in deadly class. You're doing amazing. And that's the problem. We can't talk too much. I want to bring you back on the show like mid season and again, end season. So we could just discuss things and chit chat. I do that with other TV show cast members. We have like our fan favorites that we bring on. So we'd love to bring you back on and chat more. I know we can't squeal too much right now because it's only a few episodes in. But I know you're a writer right. as well. You're a producer. So how do you get yourself to differentiate between the three? Yeah, man. They're all three different things. But for me, it's kind of like, I don't know if it's a trifecta. It's one of these things that writing has helped me become a better actor. Acting helps me become a better writer. helps me with my producing. And well, first of all, I started writing maybe like 16 when I wrote my first screenplay and it was one of those things where I just woke up out of bed and I woke up at like 3 a.m and by the time it was 7 a.m and I had to go to school I was done a 100 page screenplay it was like my fingers were just typing away and like it didn't stop like if I was on this crazy the caffeine that but it was just it was just because it just struck me that doesn't happen often at all again you just really have to sit down and and say okay I'm, I'm, I'm writing now but I remember that feeling where it just flo- it just flowed right and uh, there's something about th- that that I'm like, okay, I have to learn more about writing. So I started really, really studying the craft of writing, seeing who are the best writers and reading their screenplays, going to the library, picking up the best books on, on screenwriting. And, uh, and then I realized that once you are able to write a screenplay, you are able to understand the screenplay very differently. So as an actor, I receive a screenplay and I say, okay, look, I'm able to to you know, see it from a different view than how I saw it just as an actor, if that makes sense. That's off the hook, man. That's really cool to hear because you're a young dude. You know, you're not like 50 years old to be like, I've been screenwriting for 100 years. And when you got up at 16 years old and your fingers did the talking, did your mom kind of do some kind of like prayer ritual? Be like, my son's possessed. Or she was like, yes, he's doing amazing. (laughs) No, I feel like back then my life was still like I was a Nazi my entire life, you know, so back at that time, I still wasn't even really fully acting. It wasn't what I was doing as my career. It was more becoming a professional soccer player where my head was that there. And since I'm basically four years old, a little bit after that is when my parents started seeing after reading like my screenplays and getting producers attached and financing money. Uh, at a pretty early age uh, that they thought, OK, maybe, you know, there's there's something there in, in the writing and and uh all of that but back then i was just kind of i kind of kept it to myself you know it was kind of just i and it's not that i wanted to tell a story or it's kind of had to it's like i had to and and that's why i do what i do right now man it's because i have stories that i i have to tell i have things that i have experienced i feel like i'm i mean i'm pretty young i'm in my early 20s but i've experienced a lot of shit because i've gone through a lot of shit like at the age of 17 i completely had Dropped out of school for the third time, and I did a whole year. It was just ridiculous, like a year and a half where I was going through a really tough time, but I learned a lot about myself, about life, and about who I actually wanted to become a person. And that's something that I bring with me um, everywhere I go. And the stories from there and from just like in general, things that I observe that I just have to write about. And the stories that I feel like it can impact people. At the end of the day, I'm all about impact and I'm I'm all about making a difference. So... If I can make a difference within myself, I believe that it can make a difference within within others, hopefully. That's pretty cool, man. You know, everybody needs soul searching, and you did yours at a young age. You know, things happen, right? You were a high-impact, you know, well-known, high-level athlete, and then something happens all of a sudden. It changed your soccer career. What happened at that moment? So I had um, multiple, like, uh, concussions and, and different things like that, but then I got one severe brain injury where I... I literally spent like a lot of time at the hospital and I I was told that I had to stop playing soccer. And that was the first time where after doing a bunch of CT scans and lumbar puncture uh, exams that the doctor sat me down and he said, he told me like, if you get hit on the head again, like in a bad, in a bad way, you can literally be like paralyzed for the rest of your life. So basically that was a really hard time for me because that was, the, that was the first time that I cried in front in front of uh, anyone, really, other than when I was like two, two, three years old. You know, I was always like always kept my emotions to myself, 
in in elementary school and in high school like you never would see me cry or, or look sad at all but that was the first time I completely I was in the office of the doctor and I just started bawling because he was telling me how I had to literally give up on my whole dream that I would have been working on for for my whole life you know and um yeah I, I didn't take that I kind of lied to it about my I lied to, uh, about it to my parents. I told them, you know, that the doctor had told me something else. I lied to my coaches. Why? Because I couldn't just give up on, on everything that I had and, and that I was. So, but little, you know, very quickly after it, it kind of started catching up to me. I started having like very blurry vision. Um, my memory was, was, I was forgetting stuff, forgetting names. And on the soccer field, I was just not playing the same. I would get the ball like someone would pass me the ball and I would see the ball almost like half a meter away when it was like right there. You know what I mean? Like my vision started not become there. I started getting dizzy and all that were repercussions. I'm not taking the time needed to rest and not doing what doctors and the, the people at the hospital, you know, said I had to do, but it was what I needed to do to evolve and to actually realize that at the time I had to go through that basically to, to actually find acting later on in life, which is really what became my life. And I'm super grateful that all that happened. I can never say that back then because it just seemed like things were happening to me, but now I understand that things are happening for me. Absolutely. I believe in that so much. Things happen for a reason. And you were a young kid, determined, doing well. And all of a sudden, somebody's telling you, hey, you can't do this anymore. And any young person be like, whatever, I know myself. But then you start getting affected by it, and you had to move yeah. on. And then all of a sudden, this thing came on you where you just wrote and wrote and wrote and it flourished. And I think you put that same drive and ethics and hardcoreness about yourself to this stuff, to acting, producing and writing. And that's why you're gaining so fast. You know, look, you're acting in an amazing TV show. You wrote your first screenplay at 16. You got people to go behind you with money, which is a very hard thing to do. You got all sorts of stuff going on. Plus, on top of that, you have your own podcast. You have all these fan following and you're growing. You're like that little secret guy that's coming out and kicking butt and it's just going to boom out of nowhere. That's really cool, dude. And that's impressive. And that shows a lot because other teenagers and youngsters have to follow that because you didn't quit you just grabbed another avenue and you just kept going from there that's what i feel yeah man and it's really easy to to just quit and, and start giving up on yourself and and I, it wasn't always easy man like for a long time i think for about a year and a half i was extremely depressed like there was a moment in life where I, after dropping out of school and having, like, soccer was, like, the catapult and kind of ending that was a catapult to a bunch of other things that started happening personally. I started doing a, a bunch of things that I'm not proud of, but that I think were necessary for, for me to evolve. And it was hard, man. There was, like, a whole year and a half where I physically wasn't able to smile. Like, I couldn't smile. And I completely had cut off, basically, people around me just because I felt like I wasn't worth it, right? And, like, depression and all that, it's a real thing and something that I never was able to understand before. I remember in primary or or elementary school, right, um, they would sometimes talk about depression or mental health. And, and for me, you know, I was always, like, a very cool guy and, like, the athlete, popular kid. So um, for me, I was always like, okay, well, if you're you're sad, just smile, you know, like, don't, it's not a big deal. And it's not until I truly understood what it is to be at my complete lowest and feel the way that I felt that I, that I, I really understood that. And now it just made me extremely, um, I'm able to connect with people in a way that I, I wouldn't have been able to connect if I didn't go through all that experience. And as an actor, it makes me compassionate with uh, any character that I have to play that goes through an emotional roller coaster and goes through, through that ride. But the biggest thing is that even in that period of time, I, my complete darkest, my complete um, worst, I kept on going and I said, I'm not going to give up. And I kept on doing all kinds of stuff, all kinds of different jobs. I worked at Costco and then I worked at, I was working as a personal trainer at, at a nightclub, at a DJ. I was, I was washing dishes. I was doing all kinds of stuff also because I had started a business and I need to keep it afloat. And so like, there's a lot of things that were happening, but I just didn't. Stop. I, even though I was depressed, I still did. Okay, I'm going to do five push-ups. I feel like it or not. You know what I mean? So many fans out there are going to connect with you. We have so many fans and listeners and supporters. And everyone goes through problems. And for you to go through such a tremendous problem at a young age and understand that, hey, I have depression. 
I need to fix myself. And not everybody's perfectly fixed. You know what I'm saying? We all got issues and problems. But if people could connect yeah. with you, you're going to take it beyond just being an actor, dude. You're going to go beyond that. And it's a good thing. Like you said, you don't know your future and you don't know what's up with your plan. But maybe this is the plan for you to inspire others that are going through situations along with your acting and along with the things you're doing. Do you think if they give you the opportunity to do a movie about soccer or a role as a soccer player, would you take it or is it too devastating for you? Let me tell you something. For for maybe the, the, the next two years after my injury and after I completely stopped playing, I I completely cut soccer out of my life uh, like 100%. I remember there was a World Cup happening, I think, like a year after and you got to understand, I was a guy that knew absolutely everything about every single team. I knew, I knew absolutely everything that was going on, who won this game in every single league. And, and I watched every single game in the World Cup, obviously. And this whole World Cup, I didn't watch one game because it was just so painful for me. And the thing is that it's not only that I wanted to become a professional and that people saw it in me, but it was actually happening. That was like the year right before my injury where I had agents calling me. I had not, I had scholarship opportunities in the United States. I had professional soccer teams in Europe that I was trying out for and that I was going to be work, like I was going to be playing for some of them. So it was literally happening. And so knowing that I was at my complete, I, I didn't know who that who I was anymore. I was just a stranger to myself. So watching soccer was just way too. I, I just couldn't right. And um, but at this point in my life, man, I. That's actually one of my biggest dreams to play to to do a, a, a soccer film that that is gritty, that is that is that is real, that is raw, and that that will be a complete kind of full circle for me in my life because I still believe that I can be on that field and represent it. It won't be in the way that I thought a couple of years ago in my whole life playing for Barcelona or for whatever, but it's going to be. I think it's going to be for the screen and it's going to be. Uh, because I have a, we have a message to tell. And yeah, man, it's going to be a full circle, bro. That's really cool to hear that you overcame it and you understand it. And by you even talking about it, that's healing right there. And, you know, I can tell when I see you in deadly class and you make these straight faces, I could see something there. You know, I look at everybody. I don't look at TV shows as, okay, that's a scene. I see who these people are, what they're about. You know, my producers here send me lists of like 50 people a month. You know, okay, we're going to have them on the show, this on the show, that. But like when I check you guys out or girls or whoever, I'm like, okay, this person knows something's going on with them. There's some kind of emotion. And I could see that emotion in your face. Maybe you don't notice it. Maybe people don't, but I do. And it's great to hear the story, man, because it just brings you on the same level as everyone else. Because mm -hmm. this world is crazy, bro. And I think that's why you have your podcast, right? You're helping people with it, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's, Worst Success is a, a platform that I started. Um, I had multiple different accounts because I had a digital marketing company that I owned. And we basically help people grow influencers, um, mostly entrepreneurs and stuff like that, and, and work with brands. And that was always very business oriented um, from an early age, trying to help my family out, be financially independent for myself. But so one of the things that I that I did is I started this this account that it was all about inspiring others. And it started just growing and growing. And I just started asking people, hey, what got you to where you are right now? I was kind of looking for a mentor. And so I would kind of say, can I record this? And they're like, yeah, sure. So I asked him for his advice. And I'm like, what words can you give me that helped you get to your success? And that became like, what are your words to success? So I started doing videos to different people, like people that were very successful. I would wait outside restaurants and like the most expensive restaurants. And I would ask people that are coming out of there. Then I started also asking just people on the street because I realized that, you know, so, even success, like what a lot of people in our generation think about success is very one dimensional. A lot of people are thinking of it from a very materialistic standpoint, which success itself is so much broader and so much fuller and so much more because of social media and because of all, all these all these platforms and um, how we portray it. But the reality is that it's so interesting when you see people uh, from all walks of life say, OK, this is what this is what success is to me. And these are my words for it. And you always hear different things and different perspectives. So I thought that was super interesting. I started sharing that with people. And people thought it was interesting. So I started getting, you know, 
10,000 people following and to 50 to 100 to now it's almost a quarter million as of our talk right now. We just keep growing, growing and growing. And one of the things that people were asking me a lot for was like, hey, Juan, you know, because people knew me from behind the page. I would do some videos here and there trying to inspire people personally. They were like, can you please do a podcast? And you do, please, please do a podcast. So I kept getting that request over and over again. And at some point, I'm like, okay, you know, I know a lot of people in, in – you know, that are successful in, in different ways and let me have them on. And then it just kind of grew from there. Now we hit top ranks in business. Actually, just a couple of days ago, we're in the top like 150 in the world in the business category. And we're just kind of growing from there. I think we can, we can hit the top, top 50 and then the top 10 in the next few months. So we're just getting that momentum, you know? That's pretty cool, man. You know, podcasts, people think it's easy. It's not. It's a lot of work. I think it's more work than live radio sometimes because we have live radio as well. And it's like, you know, you got to record and you got to get them on and you got to do this and you got to do that. And you got to come up with subjects and make sure it sounds perfect because the people, when they want to listen to you, they want to listen to how they think it's perfect. And no one is perfect, but, you know, your show is doing great. Um, you know, your account's growing. That means people are listening. They're following. And use some of the celebrity now that you're on an amazing TV show and all that. Maybe you can use that to even grow it more. And you're going to get all sorts of fans out there now, a very versatile crowd. And they're going to listen to every word. And that comes with a lot of responsibility as well. And you have a good head on your <laughs> shoulders. You think you're ready for that responsibility? I think so, man. I think it's one of those things where... You can't always, like, with anything in life that is big, you're never going to be fully ready for it. But as long as you know that, you know, that you have a responsibility and that you're, you're just real, you're generous, and you have the right intentions, I think you're, you're going to get ready. You're going to become ready. That's the position I am today. I'm always growing. I'm not going to be the same person I am right now, um, like, five years from now, because I have to evolve, I have to grow. But what's in my heart and what I truly believe in that's never gonna gonna change. That's like my essence. That's a good thing to say right there. You just said things that will inspire somebody, and it's great because your fans are growing. And by your fans growing, that means that you know you're growing, and vice versa. It's just gonna go back and forth, and it's gonna get to a point where you have so many fans, you can't do nothing about it. It's just gonna like tractor trail over everything you know what i'm saying and that's such a good feeling does that feel good right now that it's growing so well yeah it, it feels it feels great for me personally i never had a thing where i necessarily liked fame actually i saw some of my friends who were like oh it's so cool you know like so many people look up to you and all this the reality i love obviously you love it when people are like hey i'm inspired by you that makes me feel really really good but th that there's so many people that are looking at you and, and like fans itself I'm not someone who's impressed by a number. You could tell me 20 million. You could tell me 20 people. But if you really touch those people deep, and me, it's all about depth instead of just, you know, like volume. It's how deep can we really impact people. And so 20 people told me you got me to see something and change my perception. And I really changed my life because of something you did. That really connects with me. Fame has never been something that, you know, motivated me. It's something that comes with the line of work, right? I love what I do. I love work. I love human psychology, human behavior. It's something that I'm so, so passionate about. So if you do good work, you know, in, in this business as an actor, as an artist, I make music as well. Well, you're going to get people that are going to recognize you and you're probably going to get fans. So that's how I, I see it. But it's never been about uh, the fame or the numbers. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I get a huge message on social media or, or by email saying something I said or something I did you know, change their lives. And, and that really, there's no money that you can give me that will replace that. So, and I'm never going to get like tired of it or, or fed up every single time. It puts a smile on my face and I'm like, okay, let's put a step forward. Vamos. You just got to understand that this is just the beginning, bro. It's just the beginning. That must resonate a certain way in your mind, does it? A hundred percent, man. But it just makes me excited to, you know, I, I try to live as much as possible in the present. And like right now having this conversation with you is, like, I'm just really enjoying it. I feel, you know, super excited, to, like, talking with you. But also, it makes me excited to think, like you said, it's only the beginning. So in a couple of years, we're going to have this a conversation again, and, and we're going to be both in, in even better places. So, so I'm excited, man. That's it, man. That's how it's got to be. Bigger and better and grow and learn and do well. So you do music as well. What kind of music do you do, man? So I started folk-type music. Um, nice. Folk and 
kind of emotional. <laughs> so I actually wrote my first album a couple of years ago. I wrote it, I, I produced it, and it's something that I did for my best friend. She she's always been there for me, and I I did that uh, for her. And it was kind of like a private album, but I went to the studio and I got it recorded and produced. So that was kind of like a folk thing. I I play guitar, so it was on the guitar and vocals. Got a drummer to to be a part of that 12 track album. But right now, the kind of music I'm making, man, it's very it's just what, what I what I feel in the moment. What I feel, it's I would say has an R and B um, alternative sound to it, and I love bringing my Latin influences to everything I do. So it uh, I, I sing in Spanish a lot of the time, and I also love hip hop. So it's kind of like a merge between all those things. I would say R and B alternative hip hop with some Latino almost reggaeton ish feels. You know, that's cool. <laughs> and a little man. moody and dark. Hey, yeah. man, it started with folk. Your friend inspired you. For you to be that inspired to go to a studio and do 12 songs, that's huge inspiration, man. Because people will just be like, okay, I'll write something for you. I'll sing it one time. Have a nice day. But for you to do I was that. In, I, was in love with, I was in love with this girl, man. Uh, I, I knew it. Yeah. That's what I knew. I was like, this boy must be flabbergasted over. <laughs> Yeah, man, absolutely. <laughs> it's all good, though, right? It puts you into the path, and that opened the door, and from that door, it made you comfortable, right? S see, in life, something has to open the path to make you comfortable, something, whatever it is, and then that opening gets you into what you want to do right now, which is your vibe, your worldly style that you're doing right now, and you never know, man, it might grow, you, your music might be, get bigger than acting, your acting might get bigger, your pod might get bigger, you don't know, man, your, your hands are in like 10 things, but they're in 10 things on the right path. You know what I'm saying? They're not like you're doing plumbing and then you're washing cars. No, you're all in one path. You know what I'm saying? The thing about what I do is it all connects. You know what I mean? It's all one thing that like I told you about the writing and acting, right? Everything like from a producing standpoint, it helps me with my acting as well. I'm able to see, I'm able to go into a room and I know what the producer on the other side and back of the chair and the casting is thinking because I've been there and I cast people, right? So it gives me a lot of different perspectives that if you're doing only one thing, and I'm, I'm a guy that's all about focus, man. Sometimes if you look at my, I don't know, my biography or re resume or, or whatever, like you're like, what the hell? This guy does all this kind of stuff. He must be all over the place. And there was a point where 100% I was all over the place, man. And it was really hard to, just because I was figuring myself out. But at this point in time, man, I'm all about doing one thing right. And that one thing, I finally understood what that is, right? So I want to become an expert at expertise. Yeah, man, it all kind of comes together. And at the end of the day, if you're able to truly focus in the moment on what you have to focus and you understand how the different things that you do in your life, because everyone has different things that they do in their life, but not everything you know, comes together nicely. You can be trying to become an accountant and then also trying to become a, you know, world class singer. And then you're also a trainer. Like all those things are not, don't necessarily work together just because of the a schedule standpoint or because of the kind of skills that you need to do for one, don't translate to the other. But I'm really, you know, the stuff that I do, it a hundred percent does translate. And the more, the harder, the harder you work on each thing, it's going to make everything really flourish. And, and it's also a unique thing. And I'm not trying to do a bunch of stuff. I'm just doing what is me. And, and I think uh, my art is the whole, man. It's a, it's a good package, bro. I had the privilege of chatting with Yul Vasquez recently and Chad Rook. And they're the same. They're artists. Yul Vasquez, he's an award-winning musician. He's an actor. He's an artist. He paints. He does all that. It's art. I think you're that same type of person. Like, you can't stop creating. I think that's what I feel about you, bro. You can't stop creating. It's this art or that art. It's just coming out of you in different things, in different ways. And that's what I feel. And I feel that same thing. And look at Yul's career. Amazing. Look at Chad's career. Amazing. And you're the same way, man. I wouldn't even doubt it if I speak to you in like a few months, you know, while the season's done and you're like, I started painting and I do, all, you know, I draw now and stuff like that because it's all art, dude. It's all art. Absolutely, man. And I love what you said. I, I can't stop creating because that's what I feel on a regular basis, man. Because to me, creating is living. And that's why there's some stuff in life where I just knew, even if I didn't know that there was a point after soccer what I wanted to do. I knew a lot of things that I just knew I didn't want to do and I couldn't do because it was not fueling that creative that creative energy that was inside me. So once I started doing things that allowed me to create, that's when I'm, I was like, okay, this is where not only I can be happy, but I can be truly in peace 
with myself and in my mind, you know? And you're only in your early 20s. Look at that, bro. Only in your early 20s and just starting out. You have some cool projects, man. You produced that whole film. What do you want to tell the fans about that? Yeah, that was a really cool project that I executive produced, actually. I mean, I did some producing stuff as well, worked very closely to with the producers, but I, I got involved much more as a... Yeah, I was executive producer. So on the business standpoint, on the marketing, I actually went with um, with the director of the show and, and some of the producers to Cannes, to the Cannes Film Festival. That was my first time at Cannes, which was incredible. So I got to do a bunch of networking and really just be there as an executive producer. So it's really cool because I was, you know, very, very young, probably one of the youngest guys and definitely the youngest Canadian because I met all the, the guys going from Canada at the Cannes Film Festival over there. And, and I'm talking with these other producers and executive producers who are in their 70s and have made so many films. And I'm like looking up to some of the stuff that they've made and I'm having a conversation. I'm in, I'm in a tuxedo suited up next to the beach in um, the south of France and we're having a martini or champagne together talking about film and about financing and about marketing and producing and writing and and I'm also an actor in the back end right so it's and it's 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 a, it's a true blessing but I, I have to tell you that you've got to be the kind of person that is just going to go out there and and it's okay to fail because you're going to be put sometimes in situations where you, you know you're going to get laughed at or, or you're going to feel like you're literally the stupidest person in the room but that's where i like to be because if i'm the person that knows the least i know that i'm in the right room because i'm only growing and i'm and i'm not staying there so i understand man i'm always about that vibe and you're so right when you're in a room and you know the least that means you're learning and there's times of humility and you just take that, you learn from it, put it in your pocket, and you just grow from there. And you're going to go up and up and up in life. And that's amazing. You were pretty young when you produced that movie um, because it came out uh, back in, what, 2017? So a couple of years ago. You probably started a year or so before that. And I know you're working on some new projects, which you can't say. You're just going for it, man. You're going for it, bro. And that must feel so good. When you get these roles or when you got the role for Deadly Class, how did it feel? That moment that you're on set and you're like, oh, my God, I'm here. How does it feel for you, bro? It feels incredible, man. It's one of those things where... I, I see it first in my mind and when you're, you're actually living it and experience it, it's almost like I've already been there, you know, I've already been there, but it, the excitement doesn't go away. You know, the excitement is just, it just keeps, it, it heightens because it's like, wow, I, I like, I saw that and I, I don't really do like consciously trying to visualize things or whatever. I just kind of, it just, it just happens for me. Like I, I, I see, okay, so this is what it would be like for me getting the role and I just kind of get into it and, and my imagination is those wild. So then, it actually happens and it just manifests. It's just incredible. And being surrounded by such amazing actors and, and producers and people in general, is, it's a true blessing. I remember when I first got told that, uh, I mean, for the pilot was one thing. And then also for the fact that, you know, the pilot was coming back and that my role was coming back on season one. Man, I think, honestly, I started, I think I just started screaming. Yeah, yeah, I remember I started, I was like, oh, yeah, because you got to celebrate, man. You know, you got to celebrate the, the, the wins. So I, I started dumping around, and that's what I do. Even for, like, every every small thing that you do and that moves you forward, as long as it moves you forward, man, I, I try to always celebrate. Because there's been times where I just completely kind of like, okay, I get used to it. You know, you get used to the wins, and I'm like, nah, man, you always got to celebrate it. But I was... I didn't have to force that celebration, man. I was just stoked, man. I was excited. Of course, it's exciting, man. A recurring role on a new hit TV show with the Russo brothers, Rick Remender on sci-fi. You know that thing's going to go at least four or five seasons. And in the comic books, you don't die that soon. So you know you're going to get paid for a while. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Yeah. So is there anything else you want to share with the fans out there? Anything that you want to tell them? The mic's yours, bro. Yeah, man. Well, I would say that, uh, you know, Deadly Class is just getting started. So if you haven't, if there's someone who has, who's listening to to uh, Comic-Con Radio and you haven't watched Deadly Class, you should definitely go and check it out. Uh, Rick Remender, the the writer, the creator of, you know, the show is incredible. He's so talented and and, you know, just like the, the comics, man, I fell in love with the comics when I first got told about, you know, the show and that I booked it. So I started getting the comics right away and I just couldn't stop. Like, I just couldn't put them down. And that's a really good sign because that's where, you know what I mean, that you get a material and you get so excited 
about it. Like I became a fan and I'm like, oh, I almost forgot that I was working on this too, right? So I was just like, oh, oh, I also get to work on this. It's incredible. <laughs> right. So I would say check out. Yeah, yeah. So check out the Deadly Class in general. And yeah, man, whatever you're doing, if you're not happy in the circumstance or the situation that you are, you're in, I mean, you have all the power to change that. It might not be easy. You might get a bunch of people that are going to judge you, are going to laugh at you, and are going to tell you, you know what, why are you even doing that? And there's moments you're going to feel alone, man. Like, But at the end of the day, it's your life. You only live it once. So go after what you want. If you don't know what you want, you got to try things, man, and you're going to fail, but don't be afraid of that because that's what you got to do. And the more bats that you swing, the more you're going to realize you're going to, you're going to come to one bat and you're going to hit it, but you just don't, you, you don't got to stop swinging. That's really cool advice, man. And one more thing before we head out, isn't it cool that you have the creator of the source material right there on set and you can just go up to him like an encyclopedia and be like, what do you think about this, Rick? Isn't that off the hook? That's super cool, man. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I hope that, you know, on a future season and, and I hope that I get to work on it again and we get to work, you know, even more closely together. Rick's an amazing guy and, uh, and he's super funny too, which is great. I sent him a photo even for Christmas and he, he has the same sense of humor as me, I think, which is great and super talented, like I already said. So, so yeah, man, I was truly, truly blessed, man. And your social media for all the fans out there, would you like to share that with them? Yeah, absolutely. So my personal social media handle is Juan Gray. So at Juan Gray, J-U-A-N-G-R-E-Y. And like we were talking about the podcast earlier. So that's uh, words to success, words, and then the number two, success. And one thing that I always say, like when I sign off, it just kind of became a thing where I started saying it. A lot of people, like when they see me or online, they kind of say it is, is vamos. I always say uh, when I see someone like, yo, Juan, vamos, vamos. Or when, I, when I'm leaving, it's like vamos. And what that means to me it, in Spanish means like, let's go, keep going. And so I just, every time I say vamos, I just want people to be reminded that you got to keep going and uh, put your everything on it, man. Take a step forward and don't stop taking those steps, man, because you're, you're closer than you think, brother. And I really appreciate you having, having me on board. And I think a lot of people just like me appreciate your energy and how cool you are and how like real, honest and raw you are, man. Keep doing what you're doing. And I really appreciate you and your energy. Oh, uh, man, I appreciate that, bro. That's so kind of you. You know, it really means a lot to me, to the heart, and especially to hear it from someone uh, as creative as you. So thank you so much, Juan. I really appreciate that, man. Hey, thank you so much, man. You got it. So ladies and gentlemen, we had the amazing Juan Gray today. He's on Deadly Class. He's doing it up. He has his own podcast. It's Ad Word 2 Success. It's an amazing show. Check it out, please. And he's just firing it up. And you could go to at Juan Gray on Instagram. Hit him up. He's a cool dude. Don't send him naked pics because he won't reply. Just say hello and you might get a hello back. But other than that, thank you guys for listening. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is your boy Galaxy with Juan Gray signing out of Comic-Con Radio. And we're going to give him a million kisses, Juan. Ready? One, two, three. Mwah. There you go. Girls, Juan just kissed you. Get it? Guys, too, if you want it. Grab it, put it in your pocket, save it for later. Thank you, guys. See you later. I'm going to go. (laughs) Yeah, there you go, brother. All right. Peace out, guys. Bye. You satisfied with your life? What if I told you there's a home for people like you? A school where you'd be surrounded by your peers. Hi, I am Lana Condor. This is Deadly Class, and welcome to King's Dominion. Deadly Class is about a high school for assassins set in the Reagan mid-80s. We've been hearing about Rick's book for a few years. The artwork is incredible. Uh, It's one of the more twisted coming-of-age stories we've ever read. So the first time we read the book, we were blown away. It's It's why we're standing here working on the show. After school today, one of you's gonna die. Deadly Class is a story of a street kid, an orphan, who has a very tragic past. He gets approached by a mysterious collection of characters who belong to a school for assassins. I'm offering you a chance to harness that fire inside you, master the deadly arts. Not to be a dick, but what do you have to lose? Nothing. We first meet Marcus on the streets. He's kind of like a rabid dog. 
He has a lot of love, but he also has a lot of like hate in his heart. Hating what's wrong is easy. I'm gonna do something about it. First year will follow his training as a new assassin. We've got the thing this place is supposed to nurture, and they all see it. And that's why we'll try and destroy you. So there's things that I can't do in a comic. There's things that just don't fit. I only have 20 pages. And what we were able to do here is take what's in there and unpack all of the characters and the story elements and get a wider look at optics on the story and the characters in a way that we weren't able to in the book. There's nothing sweet about us. We get to really feel the person behind the role, and that's priceless. Dude, what's your problem? Punk ass bitches is my prop. The cool thing about Willie is he's a badass, and I ain't no bitch like Chico. Get in the damn car. Do you have any idea where you are? Sai is the most athletic and deadly character in the entire series, with the exception of Master Lin. As soon as they put on the tattoos and the hair and everything, you can't help but feel badass. Her weapon of choice is her katana. It's a massive blade, and the, the actual weapon itself is very heavy. Um, and then she's just slicing it around, um, and it looks really amazing, and I can't wait to use it like more throughout the show. Some rep you got. We have Maria, part of the Mexican cartel, and her combat is fluid, it's beautiful, and it's dangerous. I love this outfit. It actually makes me feel very powerful. This isn't as sexy as I imagined. Safe word. The class clown would definitely be Billy. A mostra? <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Even though it's a heightened world, we're really kind of digging into what it is to be a teenager in 1987. Who listens to a Walkman at a party? This is an authentic snapshot of Generation X, uh, of the kids that I grew up with in the underground and the, the subculture. But it's also an authentic snapshot of, of just teenage existence. White Snake, Banana Bloody Rama, and Jeff Leppard. Sweet little please. Deadly Class pulls no punches in its ability to shock. People might see some things that are happening now, things being politicized and weaponized at almost every single level. So you want to snuff Reagan? Yeah, he killed my parents. Changing the world to see people shit. All the action is born out of character. None of it is salacious. Uh, none of it's for spectacle. It's all very cool to look at, but uh, contextually, you will care if somebody involved in a, in, a, in a dangerous situation comes out of it scathed or unscathed. Take a road trip. A road trip? To kill my dad. And my mom, my brother, they're not gonna survive it. It, it has the actions that everyone loves, but there's also a lot of heart and character and relatability. The best part of filming so far, I think, is just being with my friends. I mean, the whole cast is amazing, and we all got really close. The cast is incredible. <laughs> I just think there's nothing like it on television. Our job is to be innovative and disruptive, I and mean, we're looking for fresh stories to tell, stories that are surprising to people. I think people are going to be really surprised by the show. Good afternoon and good evening. This is Galaxy signing out from another amazing episode of Comic-Con Radio. Tune in for your daily shows of Comic-Con Radio. Go to comic-con-radio.com. Reach us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Comic-Con Radio. You can call us toll-free right now. 800-976-0305. 800-976-0305. Comic-Con Radio. Taking the world one listener at a time.